What's tragedy was an anecdote to everyone else. We're comic. We're all comics. We live in a comic time. And the worse it gets, the more comic we are. From the recognitions. Introduction. We often begin without really knowing why. I started this video series as a way to practice, to talk in a longer format about books and authors that I find interesting. When I began to notice is that I have a focus and fascination with artists that have a complicated relationship with fame. So we arrive finally at William Gaddis. I began to think about this as a sort of season one finale for this video series, that after we finally escape the orbit of Mr. Gaddis, we can abandon fame as a through line for this video series and move on to something. I haven't decided what comes next. Gaddis is a fascinating figure to me, and hopefully by the end of this video, he'll be the, he will be to you as well. Scarcely outside of myth and legend has a person ever been so prophetic, so beloved, and so deeply, singularly doomed. But maybe Gaddis was a myth or a legend. Much of what seemed to surround him is a rumor. There was a rumor that he had paid his publisher to release his first book. There was a rumor that all the unsold copies of, his, of this debut book had been destroyed. There was a rumor that, after such a failure, he had taken a pen name, Thomas Pynchon. In truth, he had moved to Long Island to become a family man, writing and cut an ad copy and instruction manuals to pay for the bills. There was a rumor that he was working on a second book. A second book that would take him 20 years to complete and earn him a National Book Award, his first, and a MacArthur Genius Grant. But before we can contend with the outer limits of obscurity, we need to talk about the recognitions. Gaidus' debut, his worthless masterpiece, an enormous, decade-spanning novel that seemed to contain all of life itself, because, well, it probably does. 1. Such recognitions are not reversible. Thomas Pynchon, Gravity's Rainbow. So then, we often begin without knowing why. Kicked out of Harvard after a nebulous altercation with police, a young man named William Gaddis found himself adrift. He hit the ground walking, moving from thing to thing, career to career, seeing a little bit of everything. He worked briefly as a fact checker for the, for the New Yorker. He wandered across huge swaths of several continents, working as a dock hand on the Panama Canal, and admiring art and architecture that's France and Spain. He materializes, thinly fictional, in the summer of 1953 as Harold Sand in Jack Kerouac's novella The Subterraneans. This is the position from which Gaddis would begin, tantalizingly close to real success, watching it come for his contemporaries, but not for him. Then, after a decade or so slumming it, hanging out with the village art brats, pushing elbows with the beats, traveling abroad, and always, always, always writing, William Gaddis finally delivered a draft of his first novel, The Recognitions, to his publisher. A 480,000-word manuscript, a brick of a book whose size, ironically, made it easier to ignore. Multiple reviewers claimed to not even have finished it, but as always, there is something happening in the periphery. Ezra Pound, Il Miglior Fibro himself, was given a copy of the recognitions, and when asked what he thought of it, he famously said, You tell your friend that Joyce was an ending, not a beginning. And while it's a great line and a fun historical anecdote, I think it sells both writers short, because Ulysses, and Joyce's work in general, wasn't an ending as much as it was a point of no return. Once it was made clear that liter what literature was truly capable of, there couldn't be a return to the way things had been before Joyce, and of course, Virginia Woolf, and all that restless experimentation. We are now aware that the shadows on the wall were, in fact, shadows. In the case of the recognition, it's perhaps more like the apes at the beginning of 2001 A Space Odyssey, finding themselves at the foot of a mysterious imposing slab. We were gifted and burdened by its arrival. To be totally honest, the recognition makes a terrible first impression. As a physical object, the book is unforgiving. Depending on the edition, it weighs between 2.5 and 3 pounds, and regardless of edition, it comes in somewhere just shy of a thousand pages. The original hardcover and the recent NYRB reissue, done in the same style, 
offer nothing in the way of cover art, just the author's name and the title. The Recognitions is an outright hostile book, both inside and out. Inside, the book is prickly, and maybe even entitled. It's the work of an all-seeing curmudgeon, the guy in the outskirts, sitting at the fringes of the party, watching. A hater, a crank, a real sourpuss. The Recognitions is a book deeply out of touch with its current moment, and thank God for that. Gaddis was, in detestable internet speak, trad. He was maybe even a little conservative, though not in the sense of conservatism we know, as we know it today. As you will come to see over the course of this entirely too long video, what Gaddis valued most was authenticity. In his time spent traveling, he found that he liked countries where the church still exerted great cultural force, where people participated in routines and rituals that were thousands of years old, sometimes doing so in buildings that were just as old. You could stand beneath the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel today, and they looked the same as they would have in the 1500s. To Gaddis, the continued existence of something old seemed to prove its quality. Modernity, by contrast, is shoddily made. Nearly everything in the United States, buildings, roads, machines, art, was made within the last 100 years, and done so by whoever promised that they could do it for the cheapest. It's more than just a case of, they don't make them like this anymore. It's, an, it's indicative of larger cultural ailment. Modern life is a perpetual undercutting, a, bent against the a bet against the future, and it weighed on Gaddis. The main character of The Recognitions, as much as this monster of a novel has a main character, is Wyatt Gyan. The son of a Calvinist minister, Wyatt displays an artistic talent from, a young, from an early age. This artistic talent ostensibly has something to do with the, art, with the sacrificial death of a monkey in the book's prologue. Because among 1,000 other things, the recognitions is also a retelling of Faust. Because sure, why not? Why, in his adulthood, is working as an architect. He designs bridges for a firm, but he's not some civil engineer working hourly. No, why it is gifted. His bridges are beautiful, they are works of art, and they catch the attention of his supervisor, Benny. There's always a bigger fish, however, and Benny needs to impress his own supervisor, so he begins to put... He begins to put his own name on Wyatt's blueprints. This doesn't bother Wyatt, because Wyatt's real interest lies in painting. As a child, Wyatt honed his artistic talents by recreating the paintings of old masters like, Bu like Bruegel and Van Eyck. He finds these old paintings of beauty that the rest of the world seems to lack, and he wants to capture it himself, to tap into whatever well of sublime and creativity the old masters drew on. Eventually, this old-school approach captures the attention of a, of a fatally capitalist art dealer named Rectal Brown, who offers Wyatt a deal. But as always, there is something happening in the periphery. The recognitions establish the themes that will run throughout the entire body of Gaddis' work, namely, authenticity, capitalism, and art as a sacred connection between human beings and the world around us. We are suddenly transported to a banana plantation in Central America, and it is here that we are finally offered a reprieve from the old world drama that dominates the first 200 pages of the book. That's a lot, for a lack of a better word, pretension. There's a lot of lack. There's, just, there's a lot of pretension on displaying the recognitions up until this point. Gaddis has lots of thoughts on art and religion and knows intimately the layers of New York and Paris and Panama, and he wants to demonstrate that knowledge to you. It can, at times, feel like sitting through a lecture or a sermon. And then... We meet Otto. Otto is a playwright and a plagiarist. Otto is in Central America for no particular reason. He has been trapezing around the continent while playing, while working on a play that he calls The Vanity of Time, which was one of the working titles the recognitions. Side note, the R had several working titles, my favorite of which was Three Suicides, fully explained. Because there are three of those in the novel, and so, boy, how does it mean fully explained? If all this is starting to feel a little familiar, it's supposed to. Consider Gaddis' own history, the recycling of his, working ti of his own working title, and most on the nose, the fact that Otto sort of sounds like author. Otto returns to America wearing a sling, nursing a completely made-up injury that he has no explanation for. He simply thinks it'll make him seem more interesting if he remains unshaven and wounded. He ends up shrugging off lines of questioning, telling people that something like Oh, you know how it is in Central America, there's always revolutions happening down there, which is objectively pretty funny. And here is where the recognitions begins to shine. One in its humor, 
For all of its elusive richness, its old world sensibilities, its tradition, the book is funny. It's a brilliant pitch black comedy, equally likely to make you cringe as to make you laugh. The, the book begins to have fun, at least for a while, following Otto and his contemporaries and their misadventures. Remember Wyatt from earlier? Neither is anybody else. Wyatt is almost entirely absent from something like two thirds of the book, and when he does reappear, nobody ever even refers to him by name. The target of this humor, of course, are posers, whom Gaddis takes every opportunity to completely eviscerate. Hanging around with the Beats in the early 50s, Gaddis hits multiple scenes in Greenwich Village, parties full of struggling wannabe artists, fake bohemians, saying meaningless art world things like, I am really more of a positive negativist, and later, I am really more of a, po of a negative positivist. Characters mistake a big, unshaven man for Ernest Hemingway with no proof, even though he may just be someone experiencing homelessness, a big, unshaven man reads BUM as an acronym. You know, funny. And they buy him drinks all night. Ernie, he tells them to call him. People begin to question Otto in his play because Otto takes smart things said by his friends and writes them down as his own. Everyone likes his play, but it just sounds so familiar, it's weird. Elsewhere, characters smoke a new brand new substance called marijuana and speculate endlessly on the sexual orientation and sexual relationship of their characters. There's Esme, the art scene's collective muse, an opium addict, and a sort of anti-manic pixie dream girl long before that was ever a thing. There's Anselm, whose name is purely coincidental and not a nod to German painter Anselm Kiefer, though it would be fitting. Anselm is an asshole, for too many reasons to stay here. There's Agnes D, like, like Agnes D.A., get it, a socialite whose entire social structure is based on shallow, meaningless friendships. And then there's Stanley. Stanley is wonderful, a composer and the only halfway decent person in the entire goddamn book. But as always, there is something happening on the periphery. Rectal Brown is made white, who is now nameless, for reasons you'll soon see. A deal. Having displayed considerable talent, Brown decides that White is his man, and they are going to forge paintings by the old masters, marketing them to art collectors as the genuine article. Throughout the misadventures, misadventures of, Otto, of Otto and Co., we hear references to this in newspaper headlines and passing conversations at parties and bars. We start to hear that all these lost paintings are being rediscovered. It's one of the most interesting things that the Recognitions does, and part of the reason I keep reusing that line from above. The characters do not enter some kind of suspended animation when a chapter's not about them. Why it disappears, he goes off the grid, but that doesn't mean he's not living. His story is playing out in the wings as what happened in real life. The other reason for Wyatt's namelessness is that he's nobody. Wyatt is an objectively talented artist. His work is taken as that of some of the greatest painters of all time, but he's just some guy. This is where Gaddis begins to play with the other major themes of this book. The ways in which capitalism destroys art. White produces masterpiece after masterpiece, a pitch perfect Jan Van Goen triptych or something like that, but White is not Jan Van Goen. It doesn't matter how good the painting is. He could surpass Bosch or Bruegel or whoever, but nobody will care because he's White Guan. Think about it. When you go to a museum, you're more likely to spend time from a, from a painting by an artist whose name you recognize. Some of the history is cited as good, when we begin to rate art on some kind of value scale, taking into account things like fame, we begin to pay less attention to the actual objective quality of the thing, and more to the name on it. When an art collector pays millions of dollars for a painting, they're paying for the signature, for the privilege of saying, I own an original by X. It's like the conception of modern art being all about who got there first. My kid could do that. Yes, well, your kid's not Jackson Pollock. Capital corrupts everything in the recognitions. The Pope stops to read advertising copy for sliced bread during his, during his benedictions, which is a proto-version of the hyper-capitalism that dominates infinite jest. Money is the root of all societal ills. Gad is trying to warn us that we have cheapened our entire experience, existence, in, in pursuit of material wealth. Out of a cast of hundreds, Stanley is the only character who receives a happy ending, as much as a happy ending can exist in a bitter, plotless book like this. 
Stanley is, finally, performing with one of his compositions at a cathedral in Europe, when the pipe organ at which he sits collapses, burying him beneath the rubble. Though it kills him, the book, the book ends in its final words by saying that Stanley lives on through admiration for his work, even if it is still unperformed. The same cannot be said for Wyatt, or Brown, or anyone else involved in the counterfeiting ring. Only someone who has produced something real and true will be remembered. The same might be said for William Gaddis, buried beneath what he had created and forgotten by almost everyone. But as always, there is something happening in the periphery. William H. Gass, in his spectacular introduction to the recognitions, talks about how this is a wacko book with wacko fans. Though the fans were few, they were fevered in their adoration of the thing, endlessly discussing and quoting many of the book's brilliant, profound, and profane lines. Like everyone's favorite, the best depiction of, of anxiously watching a too loud drunk stumble onto a public transportation, just knowing there'll be trouble. Merry Christmas, the man threatened. Modern cr critics al almost always use the term Janus faced to describe the recognitions. Well, Gaddis may have had the old masters, dude loved Dostoevsky. In mine, when he was writing, what had mirrored was a simmering cynicism that was forward thinking, and maybe too much so. Gaddis's work is infused with a bitterness toward the world at large, and a sense of ironic black comedy that will be latched onto by writers like Thomas Pynchon and Don DeLillo in decades to come, influencing the next round of literary titans as Gaddis himself was, again, passed over. So art and religion have failed us. The opportunists, the lawyers, and the posers have, have won. How? Why? What is to become of us? All of those questions and more will be answered if only we are willing to listen. As Gaddis told Der Spiegel in 1996, two years before his death, Today it's a lot worse. No one has read the novel, so, it's like, so no one's noticed a thing. 2. Bad money drives out good. Gresham's Law. The years passed without most people noticing. If you knew what you were looking for, the century was broken in two. A distinct before and after, with the publication of a titanic novel that most people ignored. Despite an ever-growing number of people saying, No, really, this is the greatest book of all time, you have to listen to me, a second book failed to materialize. Its author seemed to have disappeared, at least as far as the world was concerned. William Gaddis had returned to Long Island where he grew up a place that he resented immensely. Now a married man and father of two children, he didn't have quite the same amount of time that he used to just mess around, go live in Panama with for a while, hang out with the village our deadbeats, etc. He had to work, in the real American sense of the world. But on his desk, at night and on weekends, he was arranging and rearranging little slips of paper. Thousands of them, like ticker tape, parade confetti. Gaddis paid the bills for his middle-class American lifestyle by writing advertisements and instruction manuals. It was writing, sure, but it wasn't the kind he really wanted to be doing. It did, however, provide him with something nobody else had. His ear for modern America. Along with the advertisements and instruction manuals, Gaddis began to write film strips for the U.S. military, train videos and things of that nature. He began acutely in tune with meaningless bureaucratic terminology, technical terms, and acronyms. He referred to it in interviews as the babel, the overwhelming chaos and noise, all disparate and jarring, unending. As technology continued its exponential increase, entwining our, itself more and more with our daily lives, so increased the noise that it produced. Televisions compounded the noise produced by radios, Companies like Muzak, Inc., now synonymous with the kind of soulless 20th century modernity, exist solely to fill any corner of sounds left in American life. The Babel joins art, money, and God as the fourth major theme in Gaddis's body of work, because after the recognitions, William Gaddis became a writer who worked with sound. 3. It's usually, it's buried usually under paragraphs, but this is what America is all about. Gaddis to La Quinzaine Littere. So we have established that life has been cheapened, that's what Gaddis values most is authenticity, and that what he received instead is commodity. Next question is obvious. How did that happen? 
Money. What else? In, in the interview referenced above with La Quinzaine Le Terre, Gaddis refers to himself as an injured part party when he offers his opinions on the perceived vacuousness of contemporary literature. He cites Tom Clancy and Daniel Steele as authors who get advances of millions of dollars for books that he thinks are bad money. This refers to Grisham's Law, an economic theory that also pertains to Gaddis' fiction, both figuratively and literally. Grisham's Law states that bad money drives out the good, and in layman's terms, this stems from the days when counterfeiting was a lot, whole lot easier, or when there were multiple forms of valid currency. The idea is simple. If you have a worthless currency, and a currency that has real value, people will always be more willing to part with the worthless one, and therefore the economy is flooded with worthless junk. I don't know how Bitcoin works, and I never will, that's a promise, but I assume Grisham's Law is running rampant with the cryptocurrency people. Metaphorically, the bad money is bad art. More literally, the bad money is, well, money. Tom Clancy gets a million, gets several million dollar book deals a year, for books that ghostwriters will tackle anyway, which continues now even after Clancy died. Well, Gaddis has to apply for two different grant programs and work full-time over the course of 20 years just to finish a single book. That book is J.R., an act of vicious satire which takes aim at American capitalism, the explicit devaluing of the arts, the gutting of public education, well, Long Island. If it were up to Gaddis, they would sink Long Island to the ocean and never speak of it again. And for his patience, his perseverance, and his ire, he was given a National Book Award. The recognitions prove that Gaddis has an incredible eye for complex literary fiction, full of lengthy, acrobatic descriptions of places and people. He had an incredible eye for detail and could construct beautiful, lyrical sentences on par with some of the greatest to ever do it. So naturally, he threw it off the window. Produces, produces individual letters, not as junior, J.R. was William Gaddis's truly fine in his voice. Get it, because... J.R. is a real sink or swim book. 700 pages of dialogue, mostly unattributed. In a single, unending stream. No chapter breaks, no phase to black. This is what I mean when I say that William Gaddis was a writer preoccupied with sound. I suppose it would have been more sense for J.R. to have been a play, except what that little descriptive formation does exist is still unbelievable. Sunlight, pocket in a cloud, spilled suddenly across the floor through the leaves of the trees outside. Never again would he revisit the pages and pages of lengthy description that dominate so much recognitions. Gaddis had found his muse, and it was American conversation. Gaddis, like Graham Greene in England, aimed to be the writer of America, even the unflattering parts, except all that Gaddis seemed to find were the unflattering parts. Much like the recognitions, J.R. is difficult in ways that real life is difficult. There are an enormous cast of characters, some will recur, some of whom do not, and it's often tough for a reader to keep them all straight when the dialogue goes untributed. To identify people, the reader often needs to pick up on characters' speech patterns, their tics, or the characters that other characters associate with. And the incredible part is, it's possible to do so. Gaddis proved himself to be such a virtuoso with dialogue that it's really all you need an approach that will boil down to its essence later. Plot-wise, J.R. is relatively simple. It follows J.R., an 11-year-old, who, with the help of his struggling music teacher, builds an enormous empire out of largely worthless stuff. Penny stocks, junk bonds, reselling army surplus, etc. The struggling composer seduced away from the art and into the world of finance is, well, a little on the nose for a guy whose major preoccupation is authenticity in art. Side note. What is it with these postmodern male novelists writing a sprawling thing with a cast of complicated characters and then following it up with a tighter book about money? Gaddis did it. DFW did Infinite Jest and The Pale King. Paul Murray did Skippy Dies and The Mark and The Void. I'm sure there's probably more. Why? J.R. builds this fortune largely over the telephone, using Mr. Bast as a surrogate whenever a real adult is needed for something. Much has been made about the chaos of J.R. and why he wrote it, so much of it in scraps, that he arranged as he saw fit. This simulation of modern, in the 1970s, America was attempting to replicate the battering of people's brains done by televisions and radios and whatever. 
this is all true, but I also believe that a big reason for the unassured dialogue is that J.R. built his empire by phone, lying about his identity. The unattributed dialogue in Gaddis' novels also works in service of a larger, overarching societal commentary, namely that America is an individualist nation, where the traditional measures of success often reduce life to abstractions. You and I have no concept of how much a billion dollars actually is, and billionaire often refers to someone's assets or holdings, rather than how much money is actually in someone's account. Once the numbers get that large, they cease to mean anything at all. This fatalism is a worldview that follows into a frolic of one's own, which won Gaddis' second National Book Award. Frolic declares war on America's standing army of lawyers, and the endless blizzard of stupid, fucking, pointless lawsuits that reduce people's lives to blank v. blank. Frolic is essentially about intellectual property law and copyright, and who actually gets to make money off of art. The suits compound endlessly, adding, adding new layers and countersuits and appeals, until eventually everyone is miserable and nobody can tell what justice actually constitutes anymore. In all cases, Gaddis proved himself to be deeply prenascent, almost prophetic, and nowhere has he been more vindicated than his, than his posthumous novella, if you can even call it that. 4. So, I mean, I, listen, I got this neat idea. Hey, you listening? Hey, you listening? JR. Once again, someone got paid to miss the point. History repeats itself in the dumbest ways possible, and in 2021, a London Review of Books piece appeared, and it was... bad. So, in the spirit of Jack Green, I will briefly state the problems I have with somebody whom I thought did a subpar job at reviewing Guidus's work. This person read 1,600 pages of book covering the NYRB reissues of recognitions in JR, and walked away saying, Lol, this is boring. What's worse is that they dragged the endlessly brilliant Joy, Joy Williams, who might have the coolest author photo in the world, into the whole thing, citing her introduction to JR as proof that Gaddis has appealed to at least one male sensibility in the 45 years since the book's publication. Which is literally just the infinite just critique. Only self-important white guys could possibly enjoy this. Being leveled at a new target. Now that the pendulum has begun to swing back the other direction on Wallace. Furthermore, the critic says that yet his writing is characteristically awkward, taking issue with both the grammar and the cadence. Now, I want to give this person the benefit of the doubt, because maybe they just didn't like the voice in which Gaddis writes and each their own, but that being said, this review was printed in the London Review of Books. In what universe do the British have the right to critique grammar and cadence? That's a right funny thing, in it? And finally, to say that Gaddis' work is dry or overindulgent or bogged down by its ambition, or worst of all, Boring is to fundamentally miss the point of what Gaddis was trying to do. Enter Agape Agape, Gaddis' final and shortest work. It was a failure, this little novella. A consensus, a concession of defeat. For most of William Gaddis' life, he had been collecting research for a book that never quite came together. It was supposed to be a social history of the player piano, an object that most of us rarely, if ever, think about, but an object that haunted Gaddis endlessly. Agape Agape is, in essence, a direct appeal to the audience, which is always a risky move. It's a blistering, barely fictional rant by an old man sitting through scraps of paper on his deathbed. It was published post posthumously, hurriedly recounting the general gist and thesis of this piano player book that never was. Gaddis was always worried that people weren't listening, and after the initial failure of the recognitions, can you blame him? The quote that begins this section of the video is the closing line of J.R., and now, here he is, talking to the reader directly. He can't risk people not listening to him any longer, because he has something very important to say. Agape agape is the bitter pill that we have to swallow, like it or not. Hope is dying in Gaddis' world, and there is a very clear-cut cause. People no longer value art. Art to Gaddis, and to me, is a sacred thing. It's supposed to be our connection to something larger than we are, the vehicle by which we understand ourselves and the world around us. 
you can go all the way back to things like cave paintings or the oral, oral tradition of storytelling before things were written down. Art was supposed to be a way for people to document themselves, to say, I was here and this is what the world was like. And nobody gives a shit anymore. Through the gutting of the American public system, and which happens slowly and agonizingly in JR, people simply aren't taught to interact with art anymore. The average American reads at a middle school level or below. Arts programs the world over have been devalued and strangled, having had their funding cut, or otherwise had people's access to them reduced in some way. And all we had to do was replace art with entertainment, or God forbid, content. The reason that Gats was so fixated on the player piano was that it marked the exact moment when the devaluing of art began, and thus the exact moment that society went into decline. You simply plunk your quarter in, and the machine plays itself, removing the human t element entirely. No longer do you need to have the music, the artist himself, the musician, who actually sits there and plays the song, who has shown dedication and drive and get up their time for their art. You just get the song. On demand. Whenever you want it. To look at a painting is far, far different than to look at a JPEG of said painting on your phone or computer. The making of plans, traveling to a museum, traversing the space, taking in, even unconsciously, the architecture, sharing the rooms with other people, and then finally standing in front of a piece of art are what makes the painting special. It's an event, it's memorable, it's an experience, and experiences are what enriches our life. But with the advent of the player piano, the idea shifted, and people didn't want to have the whole experience. Why go to the symphony if you can hear a machine play the same songs perfectly whenever you want? And it's a problem that's only gotten worse. Streaming services, for instance, are detrimental to art. They take what should be an experience or an expression of a person's life and often reduce it to background noise. It's the end game of the player piano, a kind of Nietzschean last man, seeking only comfort. People want to be able to just put something on while in transit or while eating and only half pay attention. The algorithm feeds it to you and you don't have to think about it at all. It manifests itself as yearly superhero movies and their Disney Plus spin-off TV shows churned out by screenwriters for actors stand in front of green screens because digital effect people don't have a union and are therefore exploited easier than anyone else in the film industry. Ian McKellen has been an actor for 70 years, stand on stage, and then tradition into film and TV. He famously broke down crying on the, on the Hobbit movies because... Having become so frustrated and infuriated by the isolating process of cheap digital filmmaking, it manifests itself as Netflix garbage, direct to streaming nothingness that people will watch once, if at all, and then never watch again. Sit down, spend six hours of your life staring at a screen, root through part of a conversation or discourse, then move on. It manifests itself as teenagers on Twitter saying, Anyway, Stan, Lana, or stream good ones. Reducing music to numbers, a contest to see who can rack up the highest score. It manifests itself as culture, where everything is a subscription. Where you pay for rings forever, but never own anything. Because, as always, money is at the root of it all. With the current systems in place, artists don't make art, they make merchandise. Art has a way to, be, to pass the time. It has, be it has damaged our ability to live in a fulfilled way. Don't ask questions, just consume product and get excited for our next product. Agape Agape is a painful book with a simple desire. To be heard. It's the last will and testament of a man whose moment never came and whose warnings have gone unheeded. It's as if a machine were, were aware of its own obsolescence and he can't shake the feeling that maybe he just needs to get with the times, old man, because this is what people really want. And that's the ultimate tragedy of Gaddis' life and his body of work. He saw the futility of it, of struggling against an ex exponential current. He could tell that people were growing less interested in maybe having something meaningful if it could be traded for the guarantee of having something that's merely fine. Cassandra-like, he saw where things were headed, but was powerless to do anything about it. 
nobody cared about the recognitions. And JR, in a frolic of his own, may have been critically well received, but they are frequently included on lists of the most difficult books. He knew, almost from the beginning, that he was going to lose. After all, the title of his one book of nonfiction is The Rush for Second Place. In every single one of his books, there is an author standing character, and every single time the character is seen as a loser, a hack, or a poser. They universally fail at what they set out to achieve, and clearly that's what Gaddis thought of his own work, at least a little. Yet he continued to do it. He aimed to say, I was here, and this is what the world was like. He went down fighting, writing for people who shared in his wounded idealism, people who believed that art still matters. He was buoyed by the solid core of people who understood what it was he was doing. But from Otto to the nameless narrator of Agape Agape, Gaddis knew that the joke was ultimately on him. And it was. William Gaddis is buried in Sag Harbor, way out at the end of Long Island, and there's a typo on his tombstone, the Recon Gishens, a final joke at his expense. Exactly how he would have written it. <laughs>